Archbishop Sanchez, uh, Professor Arch, and uh, dear sisters and brothers. Well, the uh, past two, three days was very enriching for me. The papers, the discussions, and above all, the, the committed and wonderful people around. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this process initiated by Pope Francis. Can I have the PowerPoint, please? This is the summary of my presentation. I'll deal with kidney trafficking in India mainly. Who are the organ traffickers? Who are the victims? Who are the beneficiaries? A little bit of the financial aspects. And then the Transplantation of Human Organs Act in India. A few ethical dilemmas. And I'll focus on a possible way forward for India. Now, India is a wonderful country, and I'm proud of my country. It's a land of diversity and rich richness. But it's also a land of contradictions. We have some of the richest people in the world, in my country. And we also have a lot of poor people. We have scientific software engineering brains who have gone all over the world contributing to the society in my country. But there's illiteracy also in my country. Well, India is a growing hub of medical tourism today. People from all over the world come to India for high-tech procedures at a very low cost compared to elsewhere in the world. So we have, we are a hub of medical tourism, but at the same time, majority of the Indians have very limited access to essential health care. Even today in India, some parts of India, the leading cause of death among babies is pneumonia and diarrhea. And the leading cause of death among young adults is malaria and tuberculosis. And even today in some parts of India, young mothers face delivery in fear of death. Now, who are the organ traffickers in India? There's an excess between medicine, politics, industry, and the kidney scandals in India. There are indications that some doctors and authorization committees, these are committees that has come as part of the law. They know about it, but it's very difficult to generate evidence regarding their involvement. There are indications that political allies of patients and physicians pressurize these committees to allow you know, certain, to bypass certain processes. Doctors also accuse each other, suggesting that some of them could be involved in procuring organs. Now, about the victims. Who are the kidney sellers? Some of them are from the urban slums and largely women. And some of them are from the drought prone farming districts near the cities where transplants take place. Why do they sell their kidneys? Most of them sell their kidneys to pay off debts, but majority of them fall back into the debt cycle. How do they acquire these debts? The leading cause of debt is in the rural population is marriages, mostly dowries. They sell their properties, they borrow money in order to marry off their daughters. The second common cause is medical expenses. Then legal fees, education of children. Uh, so these are the things which push them into debt. And in order to come out of this debt cycle, they sell their kidneys. In many cases, once they get this money, husbands finish the money on liquor. This is after selling the kidneys. 
very few have bank accounts and so what they do is they approach the local money lenders when they are in need and there is a chain of exploitation uh, connected to this i quote kidney sounds emerge through interactions between surgical entrepreneurs persons facing extraordinary debt and medical brokers as a region becomes known to brokers as a kidney zone their search for new sellers intensifies thus the decision to sell a kidney is not just because of a natural state of poverty but also linked to a debt crisis as well as the availability of a kidney market dr lawrence cohen has done a lot of study in india regarding organ trafficking now who are the beneficiaries of this organ trafficking in india in the early 1990s this was before that uh, law came into existence the tra transplantation of human organs act experts have identified four transnational circuits of business collaboration and patient referral before 19 in the early 1990s india was linked to uk north america russia and the indian ocean circuit that's the middle east asia southeast asia and the north africa this is where the kidneys were you know this was happening after the law was law came into existence that is 1994 the strict implementation of the transplantation of human organ act transplantation of human organ act made it difficult for foreign recipients so a new phenomenon is evolving the non resident indians became kidney buyers from india because there's a clause in the law that only a closely related person can receive kidney but there's also a loophole there if you are emotionally related you can donate so that is being exploited um, so cohen actually calls this as biologization of diasporic return what happens is these are people who have migrated from india to the affluent countries and because of their lifestyle they are now developing kidney failures so they are back to india you know getting organs the involvement of five star hospital chains in india has been highlighted in this transplant tourism um this is this happened after the liberalization privatization process that happened in india so the involvement of the industry especially this hospital industry is complicating the situation now who are the beneficiaries they are the buyers what what happens is these buyers often underestimate the long term cost of immunosuppression therapy leading back to kidney failure so they are not told that it takes 2 years of treatment with the cyclosporins and all those things so uh, buyers benefit initially but in the eventually in the long run they are also losers in this kidney business so it's mostly the brokers the doctors the transplant centers and eventually the, in the long run it's the drug companies that benefit from this whole business a little bit of the financial aspects of the organ trafficking you can see that uh ninth this was a study conducted in 305 kidney sellers from chennai chennai is a city in 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 southern india um so 96% of these people they sold their kidneys in order to pay off debts and the debts came from day to day expenses like food rent household expenses medical expenses these were the things which pushed them into debts um after selling their kidneys 74% of them still had debts so they were not able to come out of the debt cycle now this is the blue line is what is promised this is in dollars so it ranges from $450 to $6280 this is what is promised when they get this organ sellers but finally the red line shows the 
what they receive. So on an average, they are promised 1,410 and they receive about 1,070. What happens to the victims? These are mostly psychosomatic problems because you can survive with one kidney if you do it, pro I mean, in the sense, that's enough. But most of these people complain of tiredness, weakness, dizziness, inability to work. And there's something called a half-man syndrome, a feeling of incompleteness, emptiness in the abdomen, a lack of sexual potency with fear and anxiety about the remaining kidney. These are all associated with uh, uh, selling their kidney. There's also high level anxiety, hopelessness, insomnia, crying spells, loss of appetite, loss of peace. All these are symptoms of depression. And they also, many of them also have feelings of regret, shame, and resentment towards the hospital, the doctors, and the kidney recipient. This is what happens with the victims. Now, a few insights towards developing a way forward in India. This is an amazing law, and this made a difference. Transplantation of Human Organs Act in 1994 but drastically reduced organ trade in India. And this has been a result of some of the uh, activists who, uh, especially transplantation surgeons, you know, they pushed this law. However, there is still organ trafficking going on. The Coalition for Organ Failure Solutions India has identified th about 1,500 victims of organ trafficking in Chennai, in one city, in Tamil Nadu. They say that it could be just the tip of an iceberg, considering the tri thriving kidney market in Kolkata, in Bangalore, in Delhi, in Mumbai. There are other cities where transplant surgeries happen. And so still, in spite of this law, even though it has come down, um, it's still going on. None of the victims had informed about the risks, had been informed about the risks associated with giving their kidney. They did not receive full payment and never wanted to lose their kidney. This is also an observation from that study. And some of the buyers were foreigners in spite of the act. I mentioned about the loophole of emotional relatedness. So it happens. Now these are some of the questions raised related to this. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the incidence and uh, the prevalence of kidney diseases, kidney end-stage kidney disease in India is higher than that of the foreign countries. Some people say it could be because of um, uh, the late detection of hypertension, diabetes, and all those things. And since those, those things are not prevented, higher incidence of. So in India itself, there is a, a, a great need for kidneys. Uh, the question is, is it appropriate to initiate treatment when the patient does not have sufficient resources and would probably discontinue, discontinue treatment and die after depleting the available minimum resources of the family, leaving their dear, dear ones in debt? Today in India, because of the industry, even dying has become very costly and dying in isolation and in misery. So, in the context of massive poverty and economic inequalities, how can we differentiate between emotionally related kidney donors and paid unrelated kidney donors and exploitation by middle men? So, on one hand, you have people who can pay, and on the other hand, you have people who are in debt crisis. Poor people consider their kidneys as a commodity, the only valuable position to redeem them from their debt. In such situations, often doctors are considered as agents of kidney trafficking. Given the complex scenario in India, the so-called ethical organ trade may help not just the buyers or the receivers, but the brokers and the debt brokers, no, not even the poor sellers. But the government of India has done some good interventions related to, it's not just organ trafficking, but related to anti-human, uh, human anti-trafficking. The Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India has several guidelines and instructions to deal with human trafficking, including organ trafficking. These guidelines deal with the uh, implementation of the existing laws, capacity building of the state machinery, investigation and prosecution of the perpetrators, rescue and rehabilitation of the victims, and prevention of trafficking. 
The document also encourages state governments. In India, it's structured that way. We have the central law, but most of the issues are dealt at the state level. We have 29 states, so every state has its own uh, power and law. Uh, the center can only give guidelines. The document also encourages state governments to involve non-governmental organizations wherever possible, especially regarding prevention, rescue, and This is a point where the church can get in. Now, this is one area where the church should get in. So the document itself encourages involvement of NGOs, especially for prevention, rescue, and rehabilitation. Um, the anti-human, okay, this is another intervention by the government. It, this was developed by, uh, as a joint initiative of the Ministry of Home Affairs and the United Nations, uh, UNODC, Drugs and Crime. It's called the Anti-Human Trafficking Unit. So what, is, what, what are they supposed to do? They are supposed to strengthen the district police, police headquarters with uh, equipment and tools, institutional coordination mechanism, standard operating procedures in order to tackle prevention, rescue, rehabilitation, and reintegration. So it's there. And this units, anti-human trafficking units, will also help to enhance cooperation between law enforcement agencies, concerned government departments, and the non-governmental organizations with expertise and capacity to assist trafficked victims by institutionalizing this cooperation. This, in papers, it's a wonderful initiative. Uh, this, this was, you know, in India, there are 676 districts in 29 states. So this was experimented in, uh, piloted in five states. Uh, but I don't know what has happened, what's the status of it, because probably since the UN came in, the government cooperated with them. But it's an amazing, in papers, it's a good thing. Now, I also want to talk about a little bit about the potential of the Catholic Church in India. After the government of India, one of the largest networks of India is the Catholic Church. There are four major apostolates the Catholic Church in India is involved in. Education, social work, health care, and pastoral care. This happens through the dioceses. The strength of the church in India, the Conference of Religious of India, this is a network of 822 major superiors. They are provincials generals of 334 congregations. And there are about 0.1 million professed full-timers, priests and sisters, I mean nuns, contributing to the four apostolates in India. It's a huge workforce. And the social work network of, sorry, that's not coming. Anyway, the social, there's a social work network which uh, caters to about 2.5 million self-help groups, village women, rural women, brought together as self-help groups, especially for financial security. Now, in the field of healthcare, we have a network called the Catholic Health Association of India with a membership of about 3,500 institutions, out of which 80% of them are more small health centers in the remote, part, remote parts of the country. These are sister nurses, nuns, nun, they are not doctors, they are nurses who go to the remote parts where nobody else will go, and they run a small health center, saving the lives of children dying of diarrhea, young people dying of malaria, you know, pregnant women. So that's the majority of them, about 2,500. But still we have about 650 hospitals in different parts of the country. And in a year, about 21 million sick people go through our, this network. It's a huge number. Um, the Catholic Education Network is about 1,500 schools, 654 colleges, and 15 higher education centers. We also have something called the Sister Doctors Forum of India. They are sister, they are nuns who are doctors. And there are more than 1,000 sister doctors in India working in in the uh, hard to reach areas of the country. We also have a Catholic Nurses Guild in India, which is more than about 50,000 nurses. They are also, there are also a lot of Catholic lay professionals in, the con in, in India, but unfortunately, <laughs> we are not able to gather the fruits of all that. We don't have much mechanism to gather that. They are all individually doing a lot of good. These resources can be mobilized to deal with 
not just with organ trafficking, human trafficking, with a lot of other issues, but then that also can be done. Given this potential, I feel that the church can also be a very powerful partner to the government of India in building a better society. But in spite of all these strengths, the numbers, the reputation, the experience, the pan-India presence, the church also has some weaknesses, the church in India. I think the most important weakness is that we are working in isolation. And in fact, I'm afraid that the church in India will die in isolation, you know, especially. Um, and because of that, there is a lot of duplication of resources. And sometimes also subtle competition within the network itself. In fact, this is what we are trying to tackle. I think we have enough resources in India, institutions, human resources, and even money, I, I feel. But the problem of this isolation is, in fact, you know, weakening us. Because of the smaller organizations project themselves you know, in, in, in certain forums and they get a lot of mileage and they influence the policy. In fact, um, we somehow, we were focusing too much on service provision. We somehow failed to do advocacy and influence policies. But now we are learning how to do that. Uh, therefore, there needs to be much more collaboration within the church at the national, regional, and grassroots levels. We are we are already start past two three years. We have been working on this. Just want to mention a few um, NGOs. One is the Mohan Foundation. Mohan is an acronym a, a acronym for Multi Organ Harvesting Aid Network that was established in Tamil Nadu in 1997. Uh, it was the brainchild of a group of practicing medical professionals and their friends to promote organ donation. They are not Christians. They are people of other faiths, goodwill. It works as a support group of, for patients, physicians, and the general public. These are some of the objectives of the Moen Foundation, creating public awareness, motivating families to donate organs after uh, training professionals. They're also influencing policies. Uh, Father Davis Chiramel, this is an amazing guy. Uh, Father Davis Chiramel is a Catholic priest from the Archdiocese of Trishur, India. He is the chairman of the Gitney Federation of India. He is promoting organ donation following the gospel principle of defeating evil with goodness. On September 30, 2009, Father Chiramel donated his own kidney to one Mr. Gopinathan, a Hindu, with whom he had no blood relations. Mr. Gopinathan was dying of kidney failure had no money for his treatment and wanted to commit suicide. So Father Chiramel was the parish priest of this uh, St. Saviour's Church where this person belonged to. Uh, so a committee was formed under the leadership of Father Davis Chiramel. In order to save the life of Mr. Govindadan, the committee raised about 1.2 million, that is about $21,000 for the transplantation process and made all the arrangements for that. However, the kidney was coming through an agent. And when Father Davis knew about this, he felt that it is, it's not right. You know, how can you sell kidney? It was coming from another neighboring state of Kerala. So Father Chiramel was inspired to donate his own kidney. That is how he got into this. In order to save the life of a stranger, to prevent the exploitation of a poor kidney seller, to defeat organ trafficking in a very positive way, so the surgery conducted on Father Chiramel was the inauguration of the Kidney Federation of India. And it was a symbolic cutting of the removal of his. Usually we cut the ribbon, so his kidney was cut and that was it. Father Chiramel, could you please stand up? He's in, in this room. Could you please stand up for a moment? He is sitting in this room with us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, this is what the Kidney Federation is doing. And, uh, you can personally meet him and ask him about all these details, okay? I'm not going into that. Now, what can be done in India? Um, successful intervention depends upon effective implementation of the law, availability of sufficient organs through live and diseased organ donation programs, organized strategies to educate healthcare professionals and the general public on organ donation, Media, religious leaders, and educational institutions need to be involved. The religious leaders are very crucial in India, so they have to be involved. 
Indian Society of Nephrology can also be a significant partner for this process. And we have quite a lot of nephrologists in India. There are 80,000 deaths in road accidents in India annually. Almost 40,000 of them result in brain death. So the inclusion of the close of organ donation into the driving license can save many lives. Establishing support groups. The anti-human trafficking unit that has to be activated and strengthened. There also need to be international collaboration because it's a transnational issue. Affluent countries must sensitize and encourage their citizens, including healthcare professionals, to respect the law against organ trade and trafficking and foster altruistic living and organ donation. The Catholic Church can be a very powerful ally to the government of India in building a better society. For this, the church need to work together and leverage its strengths to influence policy and be a trusted partner of the government of India. We also need to work more efficiently with a long-term vision to reach more people, address more concerns, and not be defeated by the commercialization of culture. Well, I, I don't think I will show this. It's a video clipping. So thank you so much.